Hello. Hello, everybody. Good evening, and welcome to SOAS. And a virtual welcome to those joining us via Zoom or following on Facebook. We have a, a live stream today. Um, so my name is Mariano Erichiello. I'm the Shapurji Pallungi lecturer in Zoroastrianism and the executive director of the Shapurji Pallungi Institute of Zoroastrian Studies, which I co-chair together with my colleague, uh, Almut Hinze, Zartoshti uh, Brothers Professor uh, of Zoroastrianism. Um, and uh, I'm very happy uh, the, to see many students, colleagues, Zoroastrian fellows, as well as I think we have a, a member of our senior advisory board, which is very nice. Um, I would like, first of all, to thank our professional services staff who has made this possible, and in particular, uh, Jerry Glasgow, our uh, tech support magician, who is uh, realizing this synchronous uh, streaming on two or three platforms, <laughs> and also Shiru Bilivoria, one of our PhD students, who is helping us today. Uh, and a special thank to Imogen Edwards, who is the executive officer of the Shapurji Palunji Institute. Uh, Thanks, Imogen, you have done a fantastic job. Thank you for organizing everything. Um, the Palungi Shapurji Mystery Memorial Lecture was launched last year uh, in memory of a Parsi uh, entrepreneur and philanthropist, Mr. Palungi Shapurji, grandfather of uh, Mr. Shapur Mystery, whose generous endowment in 2018 has allowed us to establish the Shapurji Palungi Institute, which is the only institute in the world totally dedicated to Zoroastrian studies. We have a number of outreach activities, scholarships, and uh, we do research. Uh, I, I would say with Almut, really broad teaching offer uh, in languages, history, religion, culture. Um, and last year, we had the honor of having with us uh, a distinguished guest, uh, Justice Rointon Farinariman, who delved into the Sasanian uh, dynasties of uh, for, for over 400 years, who ruled Persia for 400 years. And I'm very happy, and it's a privilege for me to welcome here today with us Dr. Leila Bevaina. Uh, Leila is Assistant Professor of Anthropology and Founding Director of the South Asia From Asia Initiative at the Chinese University of Hong Kong. She received her PhD in social anthropology from the New School for Social Research in 2015, has an MA in anthropology, and another MA in social thought from New York University. Her research lies in the intersection of urban property and religious life within the legal regimes of contemporary India. She has conducted fieldwork in Mumbai and Hong Kong with a focus on the Parsi Zoroastrian community. Um, and uh, her book, entitled Trust Mothers, which I have here with me, uh, Parsi Endowments in Mumbai and the Horoscope of a City, was published in 2023 by Duke uh, University Press. It engages on, uh, with uh, religious endowments and trust as a mechanism of property management in the city. The title of her lecture today is To Hong Kong and Back Again, Parsi Charity and Building Bombay, the floor is yours. Thank you. Um, thank you so much uh, um, for being here, and I'm so honored um, to give this talk. Um, thank you to Professor Erichiello and Professor Hinze for inviting me and hosting me for my uh, wonderful days here in the UK, and to all of the supporting staff here at SOAS as well. Um, I really look forward after the talk to your comments and questions. Um, and it um, doesn't escape me that I'm here because of an endowment, right? Um, and this is what I will be discussing, the work that the endowment does um, over time. So this paper comes out of my book um, called Trust Matters, um, where I wanted to discuss the trust as a technology of time, kinship, and religious practice. So if you want to find out what trusts are, I think you'd be better, um, better off talking to a lawyer or a legal expert. As an anthropologist, I'm really focused not on what trusts are, but what trusts do, and how people use them and fight within them, how people, how trusts engage um, ritual infrastructure, and um, how people live in Mumbai today. 
So my talk this evening will show a long relationship between Hong Kong and colonial Bombay and some newer connections in the present. I'm about to recall quite a long history, um, but I really think it's not for its own sake or just to give context to the present, but actually to show um, how a small minority uses this particular charitable mechanism and investment in urban real estate in very specific ways and to connect historical giving with urban conditions of the present day. So before my fieldwork began in Bombay, a colleague once gave a talk on serendipity in the field. And meeting a kind gentleman who I'll call Mr. Sodawala in Bombay can be seen as such a happy accident. This kind octogenarian dwarfed by his large desk was one of my key interlocutors in the city who spent much time with me descri describing the trust that he manages. One of the largest land holding, land holding endowments, Mr. Sodawala's trust ran several housing colonies and funds for medical care and education for Parsis. Um, this was founded by a wealthy Parsi at the turn of the 20th century. This trust was now run by five trustees, uh, men and women of renown in the community, who met once a month and decided on larger issues of the trust. But Mr. Sodawala ran the day-to-day -day affairs. While the medical and educational funds were distributed to the general public as beneficiaries, all the housing was reserved for Parsis only. Like other Parsi trusts, his was plagued by the high costs of building maintenance versus the low income generated from heavily subsidized rents. On one occasion after speaking for a time, we were interrupted with tea, and as I looked around, I noticed the office had no computers, not one. Old files wrapped in rubber bands sat upon even older looking files. The edges of the paper frayed and yellowing. I took this brief pause to ask Mr. Sodawala about himself. He was a financial comptroller at a pharmaceutical company and retired in 1988. He was brought into the trust by a colleague who said it was good to stay involved and keep busy during his retirement. Like many trust managers, um, his was a completely voluntary um, position. He was not paid at all. <clears throat> so here at the trust, he focused on the finance, administration, and legal side of the trust. I answer to two higher authorities, Mr. Sodawala said, to the founder to whose portrait he motioned behind his desk in a very reverent manner, and to the charity commission, while emphatically pointing his index finger onto the desk. After relating the beneficence of the trust settler or founder um, and the uses of all the assets and properties that he managed, he grudgingly then described the lawsuits, the failed evictions, the municipal headaches. Mr. Sodawala then switched his tone entirely and related how Parsis in Hong Kong had saved his trust. My research on the Parsis who are Indian Zoroastrians um, and while a micro minority today are well known in India for their philanthropic giving. It is estimated that more than half of Mumbai's inhabitants live on its streets, footpaths or in slums. But for the most part, Parsis, a relatively wealthy group have been spared these issues through their historical access to space and subsidized housing. In contrast to the burdens of overcrowding and poverty faced by other communities, Parsis are a numerically declining minority with much access to space in the city with their charity housing, temples, funerary grounds, and various other subsidized benefits. Like many communities in India, the Parsis manage their communal properties through endowments. Oh, this is... Um, <clears throat> wherein a settler endows assets for a particular purpose and assigns trustees to carry out that purpose for specified beneficiaries. These endowments allow private fortunes to be translated through kin and community, both through space and through time. This evening, I will talk about key shifts in the history of Parsi charity and show a slow evolution from immediate giving, right from the hands of the donor to the recipient, to more sustained philanthropy through the 19th century until the 1890s when form, giving is formalized under colonial law as public charitable trusts. The funds for this giving were first earned in the country trade conducted by the British between China and colonial India. Critical to this mode of accumulation and giving for the Parsis of Bombay was the role of investment in urban real estate, which moved from serving as personal wealth into its fundamental role in communal investment and city life. So I don't want to wish to claim that Parsis were the only Indians who became wealthy th through trade and give 
gave generously in philanthropy. There are many, many examples in many different other communities. Um, but Parsis had also the distinct advantage of being a colonial elite and giving, gave them, and who, which gave them access to early favors and access to land um, that were denied other natives in India. Um, so their story in India begins around the 18th, 8th century as boatloads of Zoroastrian settlers referred to as Parsis migrated from Iran to India's west coast to seek new opportunities and flee religious and economic persecution in Iran. The migrants were to remain exclusive as per an agreement with the ruler to adopt um, some local customs and practices, but also they retained many practices from their homeland um, like Zoroastrian codes and customs in this new environment. This particular history of minorityhood has become a major factor in the form and types of philanthropy in the community. So this paper relies on historical material not merely to explain the context of the Parsis in Mumbai, but the broader claim of my research on trusts is that they are mechanisms that not only bind the obligations of an individual to an entire set of beneficiaries, but also intimately connects the past and the present. So in that sense, what my book discusses is the trust's own historicity, its capability of carrying um, old wishes and, um, um, and, and old structures of law with it into the present. While the center of Parsi communal life remains in Mumbai, the community through its ties to the shipbuilding, the opium and tea trade had for centuries a quiet presence in Hong Kong. Trade brought the Parsis to Hong Kong in the mid 18th century and a small group remained and settled after the British took over the island in 1841. Just as in Bombay, the Parsis in Hong Kong through various uh, philanthropic and for-profit endeavors built up various sectors in this colonial city including banks, hospitals, the ferry system, and the university. In return, profits from the China trade made millionaires of several of Bombay's illustrious philanthropists and helped to build some of this city's founding infrastructure. So Parsi names like Gigi Boy, Kama, Ratanji, and Modi are inscribed in the very cityscapes of Mumbai and Hong Kong on streets, hospitals, colleges, and schools. These names do not recall great generals or statesmen, but are the concrete traces of trade, industry, and religious giving. One of the arguments in my book is that we should view the endowment and bureaucratized charity as a form of finance, and one that has a much longer history than, for example, something like derivatives, which get a lot of attention today. Um, if anyone has questions, we can discuss in the Q&A. But for now, let's learn a little bit more about this community. Charitable giving is one of the pillars of Zoroastrianism, where the acquisition of wealth is righteous if earned honestly and shared liberally. Formalized giving can be traced back to the Sasanian period in Iran, where pious foundations, and here I'm very influenced by Maria Matsuk's work, um, were established by individuals for the benefit of deceased souls, as well as the performance of religious rituals and charitable acts. Assets were set aside for a particular use or purpose. Um, and during the Islamic era in Iran, a single person, if converted to Islam, was entitled to inherit the entire family share. So in order to retain family property, many Zoroastrians settled a foundation and registered it with the Muslim authorities. Thus, endowing and um, forming endowments was a way to maintain one's um, assets. Um, but also to mark and retain uh, religious minorityhood. So today I want to tell the story of some competing logics and temporalities. The logic and contingency of overseas trade versus the stability of real estate, the perpetual nature of the endowment versus the varying velocity of the urban real estate market. Moving chronologically, I will first briefly describe how individual fortunes in the China trade come to align and incentivize with the slow migration of Parsis from Gujarat to Bombay. I will then show how these fortunes come to build and mark the city through sustained communal philanthropy. And then I'll move quickly to the 20th century when the endurance of the trust comes up against municipal laws, aging buildings, and an aging community. Um, the next section is called Opium's Traces. From about the 16th to the 18th century, Parsis in Gujarat transitioned from mostly agricultural vocations to shipping and trading with local communities and colonials, 
making them some of the most important brokers um, with the British East India Company. Rustam Manek, a Parsi in Surat, was a key broker first with the Dutch and Portuguese. He amassed huge fortunes and gave generously to his community and beyond. Charitable giving at this time mostly responded to crises like famines or fires and was marked by immediate giving from donor into the hands of the recipient. Many Parsis like Manek became highly involved in what was called the country trade of tea, cotton, and opium between Europe and China as trade was in the hands of private merchants as a, at this time as a large portions of Western India weren't completely firmly under British rule. Risks were high, deaths from sea and trade, but fortunes could be enormous as the political and economic fortunes of the more northern part of Surat were declining, the British began to move into Bombay and incentivize natives to do so as well. In 1728, Manik's son Nauroji set up the Bombay Parsi Panchayat. At this moment, the Parsi Panchayat was just a council for self-governance, not yet a formalized trust and a temple which aided um, the arrival and settlement for Parsis in the city. This early period marks, the sh marks shifts in the history of Bombay as it grew from a, a set of small islands of fishermen to a colonial entrepot. We can already see a parallel here with the early history of Hong Kong as a colonial settlement. The country trade required large ships, and in 1783, master shipbuilder Laoji Wadia was granted Lal Bagh in, in the Perel section of Bombay as a completely tax-free Inam grant to encourage his move to Bombay. So this is really one of the, the what makes the Parsi community's history in Bombay very unique. Um, if anyone knows uh, Bombay, Mumbai today, the who owns property is very occluded. Okay, the people don't outright own land. They might own a section of their land. They might just own the house upon it, etc. cetera. Um, but Parsis as favored natives under the British and Portuguese uh, colonial systems were granted land with outright ownership. This is very um, key to um, the way that they were able to um, accrue wealth. <clears throat> In an effort to promote trade, the Bombay government de developed incentives um, for industrious natives to settle by allowing construction wherever they chose, as long as the houses did not interfere with the defense of the island. In this way, large tracts of the emerging city were parceled off to colonial elites. Early Parsi migrants to Bombay, other than merchants, were weavers, carpenters, and other kinds of artisans working to serve the company. But according to historian Amalendu, Amalendu Guha over this period, Quote, there was an intra-community structural change, an embourgeoisie, uh, however immature, or more or less the entire Parsi community. So at this moment, the entire community goes from being mostly farmers into being low-level merchants. Um, so there's a very big shift socially for the Parsis. One of the major reasons for this is the sustained nature of community philanthropy that was practiced by many of the Parsi merchants and others who made their fortunes in the China trade. Um, the novelist Amitav Ghosh, writer of the Ibis Trilogy, an account of the Opium Wars from an Indian perspective, let me just see if I have, yeah, um, writes quite remarkably that the Parsis left few narratives of their experience in the China trade outside of personal memoirs um, and the fabric of the Parsi Gara Sari, so, yeah. Um, which are elaborately embroidered saris um, on China silk, often with Chinese motifs. But I argue that their trade fortunes had more concrete residues in the built landscape of Bombay city itself. Many traders like Framji, Kawasji, Banaji, um, no, um, who once owned, uh, where is I? Who once owned 40 ships endowed Parsi temples and other sacred space for his community. And again, this early settlement um, and the spaces where the Parsis were allowed to, to settle has created a kind of geography of Parsis in very certain places in um, Mumbai today that have lasted. So a huge collection in South, uh, South Mumbai and then um, some around Bandra and Salset. In this early period of settlement, inter-Asian trade fortunes brought great fortunes to the city and these began to be invested in real estate for lavish private residences. So this, for example, is the mansion of the Sassoon family who also made their money in the China trade. Um, 
And slowly by the end of this era into the next, these private fortunes moved into endowments and city improvements, and the traces of opium further disappeared into the fabric and stone of the city. My next section is called Building Bombay. The 1840s marked a shift in the trade fortunes of many of Bombay's trading elite, as trade was opened up from the monopoly of the East India Company to other British traders who had better access to credit. Many Parsis and other Indian traders made huge losses during the Opium War, um, and were also losing profitability at the advent of the steam shipping, as steam shipping outpaced their older ships. By 1860s, almost all Parsis were out of the opium trade and had diversified their fortunes into banking and other profitable sectors like real estate in Bombay. For example, Hormuzji and Pestunji Wardia earned so much in China that they invested in land and by 1809, their rental income was about 15,000 pounds each annually. Pestunji's adopted son um, owned about a quarter of Bombay Island. Okay, if you can imagine. And at one time, three-eighths of the share capital of, of the Bank of Western India. Framji Kawasji owned most of the Powai estate and earned huge rental incomes along with the performing. Um, and he actually was very interesting. He performed a lot of agricultural experiments in this area. Um, so high-end real estate was bought and sold between Parsis and the British in Tony neighborhoods that we still hear about today, like Malabar Hill. It was noted in 1812 that almost all European occupied houses were Parsi property. Amalinda Guha, the historian writes, quote, Parsi capital was considerably involved in land and real estate, sometimes even to the extent of wild speculation and wasteful expenditure on country houses and mansions. In 1864, one fifth of all those enumerated as house and real estate owners in Bombay Island were Parsis, end quote. While the idea of wealthy individuals buying real estate in a growing city is rather unremarkable, right? This happens all over the world. What becomes important to me about this history is the way in which inter-Asian trade fortunes um, serve not only to gain monetary capital through real estate, but also social capital. These merchants were not just regarded as wealthy men, but also as community and civic leaders who work closely with their British patrons. Their wealth and power were put to use by British governors who were eager to see the city grow, but who were already taking loans from businessmen for city projects to make up for civic revenue shortages. So at this moment, um, uh, often the colonial government would reach out to these wealthy merchants to take loans um, to build all kinds of city projects. Colonial governor of Bombay, Bartle Freire, is quoted as saying, when I consider the example set us by uh, Mr. Kawasji Jangir by the Jamshetjis, the Shankarshets and Sassoons, the Premchans, and so many other of our great merchants, I cannot but feel that come what will, history will write of the generation who built this pile. Jamshetji Gigi Boy is another example par excellence of the spaces in which traces of opium mark the cityscape through the civic institutions like the hospitals, colleges, and libraries he endowed. Gigi Boy became a member of the Parsi Panchayat in 1823 and was considered by the British as one of the leaders of all native communities in Bombay after the 1830s. His partnership with Jardine Matheson and opium consignment made him one of the wealthiest men in the city. His proposal to build a hospital in 1838 brought forth a unique level of negotiation with the colonial government. Palsetia notes that Gigi Boy exploited an opportunity for this kind of British Indian collaboration by co-opting British humanitarian charitable standards. His knighthood and baronet title were all given in reward for his charitable largesse, which included several institutions of medical care, education, and aid to the poor. Charitable giving on this scale served philanthropic purposes, but also reputational gains for individual donors and for the community. A man of many firsts, Gigi Boy was the first Indian to be knighted, the first to be named baronet, and one of the first Parsi philanthropists to work together uh, with the British colonial government in building several public works um, all over Bombay City. Overall, in his lifetime, he gave about 2.5 million rupees to charity, a, a number that's huge today, but you can imagine in the 1840s how much it was, uh, to both Parsis and non-Parsis, and even sent monies to the victims of the Irish famine in 1846, 
exhibiting to others his largesse, not only as a native entrepreneur helping his own community, but as a benefactor on par with the British. In the mid 19th century, a market for real estate was being developed in Bombay. As Parsis already owned so much land in the city, they had huge stores of capital to invest in new industries. Stimulated by the closure of US Confederate ports, Bombay's cotton boom financed much city building and investment in centers of art, hospitals, road construction, and grand buildings. This period also saw the rise of many Parsi business houses, once involved in trade and shipyards, now shift into cotton mills and other industrial production. The speculative bubble of the, of the cotton boom burst after the end of the American Civil War, which sunk cotton prices, causing much volatility in Bombay's land market. And many shifted their investments away from real estate into endowments. So again, the endowment form becomes a way to protect assets um, in times of trouble. Um, thus, from its very inception as a colonial settlement and port, Bombay's real estate market has always been stimulated or contracted by much bigger global processes. So later in the paper, I will discuss a similar jolt to the real estate market that occurred in the 1990s. Let us remain in the mid uh, 19th century for the moment. Many civic institutions initiated by Parsis and other commercial elite always required the permission and cooperation of the colonial government, but also sometimes received matching funds. A common practice in this period was funding philanthropic works through the subscription of various donors. Another pioneer in infrastructure in Bombay was Khan Bahadur Mancherji Kawasti Marzban. Um, architectural historian Preeti Chopra shows how the spatial and structural formation of colonial Bombay was not solely a mandate of empire, but cooperative, cooperatively formed through negotiations through, between the British and native engineers and architects like Marsban. He is also the figure who establishes, the, this is so, so important for the community, the first communal charity housing in the city. Chopra recounts how Marzban was not only a well-educated Parsi engineer with good negotiating powers, um, he was also a Freemason and a visionary philanthropist. He stands out not only for his community status as a Parsi that enabled much of his work, but critically he was a committee member on various charities. Um, his role within these charities connected him intricately into a network of many powerful Parsi industrialists and philanthropists who were willing and able to finance city improvement projects for Parsis and the rest of Bombay's inhabitants. So Marsban's sort of strategy was very interesting. Um, he approached the governments for permission to establish whatever he saw was in need, um, and then financed it through the backing of rich Parsi families, um, like the Kamas who would fund it. Uh, Chopra notes that the majority of the public buildings designed by Marsban were all funded by Parsi philanthropists. And in this way, he made himself in the indispensable not only to the colonial elite, but also to other wealthy Parsis who could see their philanthropic vision sort of immortalized through stone in his designs. Um, one example was the Alexandra Native Girls Institution founded by Manakchi Kursichi, designed by Marzban and jointly funded by the government and the trustees of the school on Hornby Road. Influenced by housing models in Britain, Marsban also set up the cheap rental quarters for Parsis in 1887, which is still known today as the Gilder Lane um, or Marsban colony. The pat this pattern of, Pars of British philanthropists um, convinced their government to intervene in working class housing to uplift members of society was then repeated in Bombay and received French incentive after the plague of 1896 ravaged the poorer parts of the city. The early Parsi housing colonies in this um, existence during the plague were then seen to be really superior housing con um, uh, configurations um, as they were low density and had adequate clean water supply in wells. And these wells were built for religious purposes actually, but it actually saved many of the people living around them um, from the plague. Marsban was influenced by the Peabody homes in England, which were constructed from funds entrusted by a wealthy banker for the poorer residents of London. Unlike earlier philanthropic models, these homes and trusts, um, and the trust he endowed, were not meant to make profit, but were to be self-perpetuating, and this is very important, so that future generations might gain some benefit. Enter the charitable trust. 
a formal legal mechanism of endowment introduced by the British in this period. Um, this British legal instrument mapped very well onto existing Zoroastrian practices of charitable giving and allows property to be endowed for very specific social or religious purposes beyond the inheritance practices of an individual family. They are initiated by a settler who in the establishment of a deed and the naming of beneficiaries transforms movable and immovable property into a trust. Trustees hold property but administer it either for the benefit of someone else or for a particular lawful purpose. Um, so what is very interesting about the trust um, is the sort of tripartite ownership structure where ownership is sort of moved around between the trustee, the settler, and the beneficiary. Through the trust, the charitable intention of donors is transformed into intergenerational obligation that the trustees must fulfill. As a tool of finance, a trust generates wealth and benefit by managing assets over time. The trusts I will discuss here are Parsi charitable trusts, which often have a religious purpose, are tax exempt and perpetual. In my fieldwork, a lawyer emphatically stated to me, the law in India does not allow trusts to fail, okay, because they're seen as providing for the social good. Later in this paper, I will discuss some of the problems with this endurance. <clears throat> I think I'll skip over that. Um, what I want to analyze here is the particular ways in which formal endowments change the temporal compass and reach of charity. Again, charity before this period was mostly directly from the donor into the hands of the recipient. Past the immediate giving of the wealthy into perpetual and communal giving through the medium of real estate into the city. With another innovation in philanthropic style, Marzban founded the Garib Zartoshti Retanan Fund, or GZRF, or Poor Zoroastrians Building Fund in 1890, which was funded through numerous donations from Parsis from a range of backgrounds. By 1899, about 300 families were housed by Marzban. <clears throat> Each building um, has a plaque that memorializes the original donor. Um, <clears throat> And um, Rashid Wadia talks about how the promotion of charity at this time and all of these trusts had um, groups of trustees. You can actually see a kind of social network, a social and financial network of these wealthy traders. Um, these very networks of family and communal ties were later delegitimized by colonial legal interventions, um, but then came to be imprinted in the histories of trust documents as financial and legal instruments. So many early trust deeds list several powerful industrialists and barristers as trustees who would jointly decide on the fate and financing of their trusts. Wealthy families like the Pettits, Gigi Boys, Kamas, Wadias, Edenwalas, Sassoons, and Chinois endowed lands, buildings, and funds to their communities and have their philanthropic legacies inscribed in plaques all over the city. Finally, we're in the 20th century. Hundreds of other trusts were founded to aid Parsis in terms of medical, educational, and social welfare, including funds for Navjots, which are Zoroastrian initiation ceremonies, Gahambars, or feasts, and funeral services for those that could not afford them. Most of the funds for clinics and hospitals had cosmopolitan, um, which in India means of all uh, communities. Beneficiaries, with the exception of a few, like Parsi General Hospital, a renowned Parsi-only hospital endowed first by the Petit family, Similarly, in education, many schools and colleges and scholarship funds in Bombay were founded by Parsis. By 1953, of the 5,000 registered charitable trusts, about over 900 were from Parsis. Um, by 1966, half of the Bombay Parsis lived in charitable housing, much of which was endowed through gains earned in the China trade or other global commodities like cotton. Today, there are over 3,000 Parsi trusts in the city. And again, imagine 3,000 Parsi trusts providing some kind of welfare or benefit to about a community that's roughly between 30 to 40,000 people. Waning donations in the mid 20th century, accompanied by increasing operating costs, made for difficult times for the Bombay Trust. And I just wanted to show you the trust deed. Um, as much as Parsi identity and status were at one time marked by economic success and philanthropy, 
by the end of the Second World, World War, a new imaginary had taken hold. Indeed, this newer trope is evoked in all kinds of media relating the ever-decreasing numbers of Parsis in Mumbai and the world. The very institutions that kept Parsis in prosperity in Bombay, Mumbai, have over the years become financially strained by the high maintenance costs of their properties and the lack of revenue from rents, which were frozen at 1940s levels. Along with the dearth of local donations, um, welfare projects have strained the corpus funds of many trusts, like the Bombay Parsi Panchayat. Um, a trust and community organization and currently one of Mumbai's largest private landowners. All trust assets are meant to be held in perpetuity. Trust buildings, if, even if well maintained, tend to be of older building stock than the rest of the city's faster moving development and renovation. While there has always been some movement of trust assets through generations, this landscape in Mumbai was further ossified with rent control laws. In its immediate aftermath, the 1947 Rent Act had surely served a purpose. Um, <clears throat> but its own endurance, the endurance of the act, had many accounts taken a devastating toll on Mumbai's real estate market. This freezing of rental values greatly favored those who were already tenanted and settled into the city before the advent of the law. Newer immigrants to the city were always at a disadvantage. So if you look at um, the kind of housing issues Mom uh, Mumbai has today, a lot of it is um, greatly, greatly favors people who had moved to the city and were tenanted before 1947. And this, I'm not saying it's the only reason, but it's one of the huge causes of um, the growth of informal settlements and slums in the city. For trusts like the BPP and other landlords, the Rent Act had grown to have some devastating effects. The subsidized rents that charity tenants enjoyed before 97, 1947 were then forever frozen by the Rent Act. Furthermore, because of the Act, the trust had no way to remove successive generation of tenants from charity flats, even if they became millionaires. Right? So once you had the rental certificate, no one could get you out of that flat. So today, some middle-class Parsis rent charity flats of about 600 square feet in a housing market that rivals Manhattan and pay about five pounds per month. Um, so while some of the stipulations of the act continue to this day, the perpetual nature of the trust and the equally ossifying consequences of the Rent Act left trust flats in very slow circulation and led to a gradual increase in the waiting list for charity, for charity housing. Many trust managers that I spoke with bemoaned this permanence. Since many of the older trust deeds were written in the late 18th and 19th centuries, they have stated provisions for now out, even outdated technologies. One manager related to me how his trust had to go to court to be able to provide funds for light bulbs instead of the oil lamps that were listed in the trust deed. The main issue for many trusts with built space and housing is that the price of upkeep of these spaces far exceeds the minimal income they receive from residents who are again paying 1940s rents. One former trustee of the Parsi Panchayat explained to me, the BPP has properties, not funds. Housing requires funds, so we must sell flats. And this has become very controversial in the community. This liquidity or lack of liquidity seems to be fundamental problems of older trusts which manage housing. As their building stock become older and older, they are unable to generate enough income through frozen rents. That is, the BPP, like other older trusts, are short on liquidity and must maintain large estates um, in need of repairs and get little to nothing from the tenants. As a Mumbai developer, um, who it was very interesting, I met a, a developer of just um, high-end real estate in Mumbai, and he exclaimed to me, because he does, did some pro, pro bono work as well, and he said to me, poor housing is expensive. Many trusts are forced to dip into their corpus funds for a maintenance and upkeep. And if you are involved in a trust, you know that dipping into your corpus funds is very, very dangerous. It's a short-term gain um, causing many, many long-term problems. Mr. Sodawala, who I introduced at the beginning of this talk, told me the story of, the, of his housing colony um, that he manages in Mumbai. The original land of the Bagh was gifted by the colonial governor. And in the 20th century, the trust was formed, and later the title was transferred to the entire community. So the, again, the Bags have collective ownership from the community, only managed by trustees. 
Today, it is quite forested and quiet compared to the main road in front of it, whose traffic belies the normal bustle of Mumbai's northern suburbs. For many years, his trust was doing poorly. The then Indian market liberalization came in the 1990s and caused a seismic shift in the property landscape of Mumbai. This regulatory intervention, along with skyrocketing real estate prices, sped up the velocity of real estate circulation all over the city. For trusts like the Panchayat, new redevelopment projects on trust lands suddenly had great potential to increase their cash corpus, to maintain their current housing stock, and to attract the wealth of richer Parsis um, in Mumbai and abroad. The BPP and many other trusts in Mumbai, in need of initial investments right, for these redevelopment projects, then turned eastward to more liquid co-religionists in Hong Kong. Mr. Sodawala related how the colony's expenses were once greater than the rents frozen um, between one and uh, between one dollar and a dollar fifty at the time he was um, saying. Right, these are rents on quite large flats in the city. We were deep in the red, he said, and then there was a thought of making the colony cosmopolitan, that is, open to non-Parsis. The plots are leased for 99 years, and with the maximum ground rent was, was all set up in the trust deed. The tenants of his trust were mostly older, and there was never a vacancy, um, because upon death, he said, you know, if someone dies, all of a sudden, somebody's long-lost cousin shows up and sits in the flat, right? And then, again, um, there's a lot of litigation here as well, and he says no one has ever moved out of his colony with just an eviction notice. Every single case goes to court. Then the Hong Kong Parsi Fund gave four crore to the trust and they built 30 new tenements on lease. This large donation saved the trust, according to Mr. Sodawala, and allowed it to maintain its original mandate while accommodating new and deserving tenants. So it was such a, just during the interview, he spoke so reverently of the founder of the trust. Then his face dropped and he got very angry, explained to me how many times he has to go to court. And he, you know, it's kind of the, his impression was, I didn't sign up for this. I didn't, um, this was not my intention when coming to be a trust manager. Um, and then all of a sudden he starts talking about Hong Kong again and smile on his face um, because he really sees the, the Hong Kong injection of liquid funds as saving his trust. The fates of Hong Kong and Bombay for all their respective inhabitants have always been connected to transnational trade and finance. While the small Zoroastrian settlements in East Asia remain close-knit and endogamous, they could not shield themselves from larger geopolitical situations. Um, so the, the local anjumans or community centers were built in several places and moved because of wars and, um, for instance, um, they, they had spaces in Shanghai, but then after the Chinese Revolution, all fled and went to Hong Kong. Um, this trust in Hong Kong was set up in 1874 and is today the richest Parsi trust in the world. Early Parsis in Hong Kong were able to buy large parcels of land through auctions, and through prudent investment, were then able to provide much charity to various recipients. For example, Sir Homas G. Modi was the major donor for the founding of Hong Kong University um, and various other civic institutions. And his birthday is annually recognized and honored at the university. Um, so one year, I, I was able to go with the Parsi priest in Hong Kong to garland Sir, uh, Sir Modi's um, bust in, at Hong Kong University. He, along with Dorabji Mitaiwala, started the first scheduled Cross Harbor Ferry, which then becomes the Star Ferry. Um, and in, since 1931, Parsi life there had centered around um, the Zoroastrian Hall at Leighton Road in the Causeway Bay area of the island. We are very fortunate here in Hong Kong, said the managing trustee to me when I visited for field work in 2017. Truly, the fund is the richest Parsi charity organization in the world, giving about 1.6 million US dollars in 2010 alone to various causes. Beyond being early shareholders in HSBC, it was real estate investment from Parsi traders which enriched the community of about 200 people today. In the late 1990s, the Hong Kong community voted to tear down this three-story hall and build a tower renting out all but three floors to commercial renters. Much of our, quote, much of our current ability to give is all of this, said the trustee pointing around him on the fifth floor of the Zoroastrian building. 
the new building gained 100% rental occupancy quickly and raised an annual income of about 1 million US dollars. The fund was able to pay back the loan for redevelopment within a few years, and now all the rental income is invested through the fund prudently for the global community. Since then, they support numerous community gatherings and have been able to employ a full-time priest from India, a luxury that many of India's and especially Bombay's temples cannot afford. What is critical about this charitable giving and investment is that it is carried forward through time by the descendant of these initial settlers, right, in Hong Kong, in Bombay, through legal instruments like endowments. Along with endowments from individuals, the fund in Hong Kong was able to donate the initial investments for many new developments in Mumbai. Many newer trust buildings strewn across the landscape of Parsi housing um, now have plaques honoring their donors from Hong Kong. In 2010 alone, the Hong Kong Trust donated about 72 million rupees to various Parsi institutions. This trust to trust transfer is one of the only ways to finance any kind of medium to large scale property projects in Mumbai for trusts, which require huge initial investments. So the BPP, for example, received enough funds to build the Shapurji Fakirji Joki Agyari, or fire temple at Godrij Bag, from the trust of Joki's family in Hong Kong. In 2011, a Hong Kong Parsi, Jangir Homasji Ratanji, whose family were early trustees in Hong Kong, urged Hong Kong Parsis to donate. Quote, we who live in Hong Kong and prosper from the patronage of this community owe it to our fellow human beings to return to the common welfare an adequate part of whatever surplus we may accumulate. We can, none of us unmindful of our obligation to our less fortunate fellow men and women, whatever our race and whatever our religious belief, our common humanity demands our, our help for the needy and suffering around us. Um, so this perhaps very long durée approach to Parsi religious giving is an attempt to think through how inter-Asian trade fortunes come to congeal in formal and legal charitable instruments as a process of, financialization, of the financialization of giving. Key to this story is the role of urban real estate, which begins as personal and social equity and then becomes the critical asset in communal investment. The financial logic and perpetual nature of the trust reorganizes religious giving into an intergenerational relation of obligation and accountability. But as with all temporal logics, it runs against others. The perpetual nature of the trust um, against the rent control laws, for example, puts much of this obligation at risk. At risk. So what my book describes is how the trust allows stretched or tempor temporally stretched giving, connecting the beneficence of a 19th century merchant like Gigi Boy with Mumbaikers today. As a document and as a legal mechanism, the trust serves as a hinge in time and space. It marks the transformation of religious giving, which helped to build Bombay and now rebuild Mumbai and connect a small diaspora minority group to its homeland. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Leila. It was fascinating, insightful, and you know, I did not know much about this transitional dimension of the Parsi charity. And here there are some of the leading trustees of the Russian Trust Funds. They, they are primary actors of this transnational <laughs> charity giving. Um, I would like to open the floor for questions. I would start with a small yep. question myself. Sure. So uh, by reading also your book, and you beautifully described this tension between the original purpose of charities, mm -hmm. this perpetuity, yes. and then how the mechanisms become a bit cumbersome and difficult. Yes. Uh, it seems that both beneficiaries and trustees, they really don't have a big agency in dealing with these issues. Mm. So I wonder if law itself is, a, is an actor in, in, this, in the Parsi community. Yes. What do you think? Uh, that's a great question, thank you. Um, actually, I think the beneficiaries today have a lot to say in how um, charities are run, especially in Mumbai, where you have beneficiaries that call them, that describe, in my fieldwork, I met someone who says, I am the watchdog of the 
Panchayat. He says, I am a Sioux maker. That's what he said. He says, trust breaker, Sioux maker, right? So he not only goes around constantly suing the Bombay Parsi Panchayat, but helps others to do so, right? Because actually taking um, a trust to court takes a lot of legal acumen. So he has put it upon himself to help other poor beneficiaries to be heard in court. And because in Mumbai, um, in the state of Maharashtra, all trusts are run uh, by the Charity Commission, which is a member of a section of the High Court, every single dispute goes through that system. Um, so in a sense, trusts have also kept uh, Parsi lawyers in business because uh, people must fight through the court system because there's no accepted um, adjudication system outside of the court system at this moment. The Bombay Parsi Panchayat used to have that role of adjudicating dispute, but they no longer do. And now they're actually usually the target of the dispute. Oh. <laughs> uh, that's why we have so many Parsi lawyers then. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, questions for Lela? Uh, we have also a microphone there. Um, thank you very much for that fascinating talk. Can you just expand uh, for me, because I don't know, how the Parsis or the Zoroastrian Parsis came to be the favoured, as it were, native group uh, under the British rule? Um, that's a, a very good question. I don't know if I have a, um, a, the right person to ask. I think a, a Parsi historian would be better. But from what I know, um, the Parsis became favored. Parsis, in, especially in Surat, were leading merchants alongside um, Muslim communities. And they were both really vying for all of these contracts with British merchants. And the Parsis seemed to have won out um, for many reasons. Um, so if you look at some... Um, um, letters and things like that um, from the British side, it was kind of the outward looking westernization of the Parsis that led them to have these close relationships. Yeah. But just to, but the Parsis um, were already favored natives even under the Portuguese and the Dutch, um, right? So they were always outward looking. And I think part of it is because they were such a tiny minority. Um, struggling, right, in a, in a, with other merchant communities that, that forced themselves to stand out, yeah. Thank you for a really interesting talk. I just wondered um, what, what the nature of the complaints are and um, why people are constantly suing the trusts. And if there's a record of, you know, historically of those disputes and how it's changed over time. Mm, that's a great question. Um, a lot of the current disputes are um, through the trusts are because the trust uh, does not keep up maintenance on a flat. So a person will have to spend their own monies, take the trust to court. Um, in the book, I discuss a case um, that happened in about 2008 to 2010 when many Parsis grouped together, they called themselves the 104 families that grouped together, claiming that the panchayat, they were on the wait list, but the panchayat took other people. So they were claiming um, mismanagement of the flat allotment. So that is basically one of the big um, issues. And I've just related the housing end of the story, but the Bombay Parsi panchayat, in its own words, um, gives welfare to Parsis from the womb to the tomb. So you can imagine all the things that people have to fight about. Um, but it's mostly they claim, so this is what beneficiaries claim, that the trust mismanages um, its charity. Yeah. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you for your talk. Uh, when, when these charities started, Bombay was, uh, uh, or Mumbai as it's now called, uh, was, was a, was a large city, but now it's become a mega city. Uh, how does that actually, what are the implications uh, of that for, for uh, 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 the, the, the value of property? For example, at one point, at one point, about 20 years, 30 years ago, one quarter of Japan's total wealth was in central Tokyo mm -hmm. until there was an economic collapse. Um, the, other, the other point is that you mentioned that these communities actually getting smaller. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, what are the implications of that for, for the future in, say, 100 years' time? Um, great questions. Yes, Mumbai is indeed, right, the maximum city, the mega city. Um, um, one of the, so there are many issues going on. First of all is the fact that about half of the city, as of now, lives in informal housing on footpaths in slums, right? So this puts what the Parsis have in terms of charitable housing in great relief. Um, so, um, and the stakes of these flat and their ownership and their value is extremely high at this time. So what was very sad to me in my um, research was how many Parsi families were in disputes amongst one another over flats, right? Because the value of these flats had ex increased exponentially. So say one sibling goes abroad, the other one stays in Mumbai, um, the, the will of their parents says one thing, the other one disputes it, and it's all because they are sitting on millions and millions of rupees. If they can sell the flat to another Parsi, so this is another thing with the, the charity flats in, that are for Parsis only are usually under a covenant where they can only be sold to other Parsis. Um, this is a way for the community to sort of stay, remain with enclave living. Um, in terms of other sort of bigger city politics, many of um, trust properties, and this is true for all of the communities, uh, especially religious properties are encroached upon, right? So other people are living within them or um, slowly move, you know, break down the wall and will live on their spaces. This is, a, again, a huge problem beyond um, just the Parsi community, but um, as the city is extremely, extremely congested. Yeah. <coughs> Laila, my personal observation is that th this form of philanthropy, well-meaning though it was, mm -hmm. and the trusts, have actually been a retrograde step for the community. People who grow up in these sheltered housing bags generally tend to be inward-looking. Generally, I'm, I'm saying something controversial, but <laughs> it ha this is my experience. They are not entrepreneurs. They tend to go and work for central bank. Uh, and what it has done is it has created a culture of dependency in the Parsi community in Mumbai. The people who live outside these sheltered housing associations tend to be more adventurous. Even people from these housing colonies, when they go abroad and live abroad, they become entrepreneurs suddenly. All the shackles are removed. Would you agree with me that this well-meaning philanthropy mm. has actually kept the community back rather than allowed it to prosper. Um, so I will agree with you that this is a very um, commonly held opinion um, amongst um, about the dependency created by the trust and the charity. So I think, yes, it potentially creates a dependency, but it also has led to the kind of um, richness and nurturing of this incredibly small community in such a big and diverse city. So I think without the trust, especially without the housing, we would, Parsis would be nowhere um, in a certain sense. Um, it's very interesting that um, a lot of older Parsis that I talked to very much agreed with this idea, with this idea that the youth are, they're not entrepreneurial, they don't do anything. When you talk to younger Parsis, they have, um, they say, we actually have no assets, right? So how, they're like, how can I get a loan from a bank for a new, for a new business? I have no assets. All they have is a rent certificate, right? Which is only valuable if they actually circulate it, right? If they leave that house, which means that they would potentially be almost homeless in, in Bombay today. Who can afford to buy their own apartment today? So it's, I think it's quite complicated. Um, but that uh, this idea or narrative of dependency is um, is definitely felt uh, felt in in Mumbai. I think um, you know, and I heard this also from the the contrast between how the small community in Delhi views the the Mumbai Parsis, right? Um, the Delhi Parsis say, you know, we are we own our own homes and we do all of these things, and the Bombay Parsis they're just dependent on charity. But if you look at it from the side of a young person who um, lives in a nice flat, um, who actually has no other asset, right? 
Um, they say that we can't just like run off to the bank. I mean, now there are so many initiatives I know that the um, Parsis are trying to do to um, give sh small investments and things like that into young entrepreneurs. But and I, it's about time. I think that's really, really important. Yeah. So I have a question. When um, newer trusts are being sort of conceived of, mm -hmm. how much are the, the, the existing trustees sort of thinking about the past and these types of issues in terms of um, structuring them in a way that would let them be more durable moving forward? Are, the, are, are there a lot of new trusts, Parsi trusts, being formed, or is it sort of, relatively speaking, the old things that have stayed? Um, great question. So the newer trusts tend to be of a much smaller scale than the older ones. Um, they tend to be maybe for, say, a new um, temple space that's being built, right? Or the new prayer hall, for example, is a very new trust. Um, a lot of the, the new, the trustees have learned from their experience that it is a very, um, you need to have a very, very shrewd lawyer to write your deed in a way that gives you enough flexibility to last through time, but not be constrained the way that the other trusts have. Um, so I think new trusts to endow physical assets and, and, and housing and things like that are very rare. It's mostly for temple and sacred space. Um, but yeah, I think um, if anyone wishes to settle a trust, get a really, really good lawyer um, to do so, um, who, who will write it in such a fashion that you won't be constrained by it, rather that it will enable giving over time. Yeah. Hi, thank you very much for the talk. Um, you briefly mentioned, I think, the Parsi community in Shanghai mm -hmm. uh, before the Chinese Revolution. Could you talk a bit more about that? Because um, I'm quite curious about the activities of, you know, the commercial activities of different sort of foreigners in, um, in Shanghai before the revolution. And obviously we know about the Sassoon family, um, but um, of the Parsis we, I suppose, know very little. So um, yeah, thank you. you know, that's a great question. I'm, again, um, I think um, a person to turn to would be the work of John Hinnells, who um, was at SOAS for many, many years and then wrote um, this amazing book about the Zoroastrian diaspora. Um, which has been a huge inspiration to my work because of making all of these connections. One of the things that Hinnells notes in his book um, is that um, we don't know much about these communities except for the ledgers of their charity, right? So they didn't keep very good records. We have a few, um, and maybe Malcolm knows actually more about uh, the Shanghai Parsis, um, but um, they were mostly there as traders and then had set up a few um, businesses and then quickly left. Um, so there's at least one family that has living memory of living in Shanghai and then being um, expelled um, with just what they could carry and went to Hong Kong. Yeah, sorry, I couldn't have a better answer for you. Leila, this is an existential question. Great. Will there, do you envisage a time when the funds will completely run out? And, you know, because if, I know it's in, set up in perpetuity, but the financial realities might overtake that. Do you envisage a time when that could happen? Um, where? Sorry, where? Where do you mean? In, in India? Yes. In Bombay? Um, I feel like I don't in the sense that, so um, what I write about in the book is, so the, the trusts can, um, are not allowed to fail in India in a certain way, right? The government and the law has a huge incentive to keep them going because they provide for the social good. Um, I think the problem that trusts have is trustees that are short-sighted sometimes, and I'm not naming names, I, they're again, 3,000 trusts, right? I'm not pointing to one or the other. The real trouble comes when they have to dip into their corpus funds, right? Because this then threatens all of their investment into the future. So I think, I think the trusts will survive. The question is, will there be beneficiaries to um, keep this all going? Yeah. Yeah. Do we have some question from Zoom? Two questions? You have sent me a WhatsApp. Wow. Oh. So, question number one. 
You mentioned the righteous earning and sustained philanthropy. From your research, what was the historical manner of the Zoroastrians of dealing with the incapacity of others to return loans or pay rents regularly? How did they build through this challenge and continue philanthropy? Um, that's a great question. So um, one example that, is, um, that might be familiar to you is the story of the Parsi Sanatoria. So these were several institutions built in Mumbai, mostly next door to hospitals, uh, to aid Parsis in uh, you know, recovery time. Um, what then happened is, especially once the housing um, crisis and, and um, space issues started to get really heated, was a lot of the people who visited sanatoria then stayed and remained as, and became residents of these sanatoria. Um, and many of them never actually paid rent, and many of the sanatoria trustees wouldn't accept rent because to accept rent would be to accept them as residents and tenants, right? So it became this like double-edged problem. Um, and then, um, so there were four sanatoria in Mumbai, currently Parsi sanatoria existing. And what would happen is that people would move from one to the other because the trustees would keep kicking them out so that they would never be able to gain residency. All of a sudden, and I forget the year, forgive me, um, a group of Parsis said, why don't we just stop moving? Then they can't really do anything to get us out. Um, and so um, this is kind of a story where um, people stopped moving, the sanatoria trustees and trusts were not getting any rents or payments, and it became a complete stalemate for many, many years. Um, the, the building stock of these places was really getting run down, and then um, one example happened that a sanatoria decided to just pay everybody to leave, basically. A lot of those the pe sanatoria residents ended up suing, of course, and, um, but it, it kind of has ha created this um, cycle of um, trustees being very bene benevolent in the beginning, saying, you know, where will they go if we just kick them out? They'll end up in slums or something like that. Um, but it actually perpetuated a much longer term problem. Yeah. Still unsolved today. Yeah. We have another question from our online attendees. So, was Parsi status as favored natives? owing to philanthropy and patronage, or did it precede this largesse? If so, why did they have this status in colonial Bombay, and why did they have better access to land and state favor? Um, so again, the, the, their story in Bombay actually starts much earlier when they were favored traders and brokers um, in Gujarat, in, especially in Surat, and then were incentivized to come to Bombay by the gifting of huge plots of land. Right, so it is, um, and then encouraged, um, the philanthropy then encourages more and more Parsi settlers to come. So it becomes a kind of um, circular um, causation to all of these things. But um, one of the reasons that Parsis were able to get so much land um, in clear ownership in Bombay was that they were already favored traders and brokers um, with the Portuguese, Dutch, and the British um, in Gujarat. Uh, Malcolm? I will come. Ah. Lila, the trust deeds which you have studied do any of them foresee ever that the beneficiaries would not ever, there will come a time when the beneficiaries may not exist? Mm. And if that happens, what is the fallback mechanism of the trust? Um, I don't, I've never read anything deliberately that in a deed that says if. Not that I have seen, um, but the, the law has a kind of circumvention. And what happens is trusts can deploy, and this is any public charitable trust, can deploy a doctrine called the CIPRE doctrine and go in front of the court. And CIPRE means as near as possible. And they can go to the court and say, 
This happened to a lot of Parsi-only schools when there were no more Parsi students um, going, or being sent to those schools. They would go to the, tra to, the, to the court or the charity commission and say, we don't have any more Parsi students. We don't want the trust to fail. We don't want the school to close. So they were allowed to apply the CPRE doctrine and say, as near as possible, we can now open to all students. So uh, cosmo open up to being more cosmopolitan. And so this is one of the ways that um, the law allows a kind of circumvention of the original objects of the trust. So some see this as a success, right? The trust endures and keeps going. The school is retained. But others, at least in the Parsi community, see this as a failure because a Parsi-only institution has now been opened up to others. Um, and this was very controversial um, in the building of the Petit Towers in the Parsi General Hospital compound. So the towers were originally built as a kind of luxury apartment building um, close to Napiency Road, beautiful views um, of the sea, and they just couldn't find enough Parsi-only buyers. So the, tr the Petit Trust took their um, building to court and said, can they utilize the CPRE doctrine and was allowed then to sell their flats to non-Parsis. Again, some see this as a huge success, right? That the trust indoors and others see it, oh no, this Parsi only space is now opened up to everybody. And I know how discriminatory that sort of sounds, but to Parsis living in Mumbai, they feel a huge loss today of the strength and um, community life that they had once known, right? So they feel under threat um, and this is one of the reasons that they really push to have Parsi-only spaces. Yeah. Um, I think we need to close, but we may have space for the last question. Exactly. Yes, is there? Yeah. Thank you so much, Leila. Um, <clears throat> probably uh, another controversial uh, question there for Go you. Go for it, okay. Um, this CPRE doc doctrine that you talk about, I mean, is there a halfway house? Meaning there, there are many, many, many very wealthy Parsis living in accommodation in some, some swanky parts of town. Couldn't the trusts uh, go to court and basically say to our own community, listen, you've benefited for so many years using the CPRE doctrine here, either you cough up and you pay, yeah. or uh, the next step will be to open it up to everyone. And that way, you know, um, that might put the fear of God up <laughs> some people and they may well cough up as they should, you know, because it's, you know, yeah. this, this, all this kind of the, 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 um, the, the, the old wives tale of Parsi, thy name is charity, you know, people are taking the mickey, aren't they really? Yeah. Um, as far as I know, you cannot uh, deploy the CPA doctrine against a person, as far as I know. Um, but um, what the trust, so, so the trust deeds are quite clear, save for the Wadia Bags, okay, the big five housing colonies, that they are for poor and needy Parsis. This has been taken to court, right? That there are some not poor nor needy Parsis living in the Bags. So, but then the question becomes who defines who is poor and needy? And the Bombay Parsi Panchayat came up with a new definition of poor and needy and raised the income level. That, and it was a kind of a joke in the Mumbai newspapers, right? That like a, to be a poor Parsi, you earn something like thousands and thousands and thousands per month. Um, but they did so in order to protect the trust. Um, for a lot of Parsis, again, taking the side of the trustees, you're absolutely right, right? These people have no right to be there. They're not poor nor needy. From the side of the beneficiary, this is the house that they grew up in. This is their parents' house. They have inherited from their parents the rent certificate. And they say, I'm entitled as a Parsi to all of these assets. Why would I ever give it up? Right? So if you have a cheap uh, apartment in London, would you ever give it up? <laughs> but it is, it is a, big, a big problem, yeah. I'm just taking the advantage of Mike being so near to us. <laughs> Always. Uh, having said that, you talk about this trust in India, particularly in Bombay, where the majority of the Parsis still live. Um, and uh, quite rightly, you're saying that they've been looked after from birth to death, as it were. 
but in the recent, uh, uh, you have mentioned that we have actually set up a, 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 a GWG, a general working group, where we are all coordinated together to transfer the funds which, where they are available to where they are needed. Yes. And it has become like a one-way traffic where the diasporas are supporting the, uh, the original populations in Bombay and India. And I know that Hong Kong are the main contributors. Yes. One of the demands that we find is um, uh, obviously the sections of housing, um, schooling, education, business, but there's one is uh, the failing health service. It's become like the NHS in Bombay, uh, where we get huge appeals for uh, huge sums of money mm. for cancers and uh, this type of uh, uh, modern technology which finds these type of uh, uh, remedies for it. Uh, is there anywhere that the locals have been able to find out the remedy to cover this huge amount of cost? Mm. Um, so thank you for bringing up. So now there is a global working group of uh, Zoroastrian trusts worldwide. And I think this also shows, and I talk about it a bit at the end of the book, that there is a kind of um, shift in the power uh, locus of uh, the Zoroastrian community today um, that is shifting outside, or Parsi Zoroastrians, shifting outside of Mumbai a little bit and re becoming much, much stronger in the diaspora. So that's one thing. One of the reasons I think that there's so many um, medical appeals that are coming out of India, even though you have trusts that are supposed to be able to take care of this, is that most of the trusts, especially if they have um, assets like housing or property, are, are wealthy in land, but they are, have no liquidity at all. And so compare that to the Hong Kong Trust, which is very, very liquid, right? So I think this is one of the reasons that um, as much as they would like, um, trustees in India don't have funds to give out for these kinds of welfare payments, yeah. Unfortunately, it's very sad. Thank you, I think we need to close on this last question and please join me in thanking Leila Vevaina for this fantastic journey in Parsi Trust so in India and Hong Kong. And uh, the next event of the Shapurji Pallunji Institute is the Idea of Iran is a two-day symposium, 11th and 12th of May, here in the same lecture theater. So if you are interested, you are very welcome to uh, register online on our webpage. And uh, please join us for a small drink reception. And thank you so much for coming. Thank you.